Brother Jonathan's topic this morning is your zeal hath provoked very many. And his text is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia and Achaia, was that Achaia was ready to a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Now to the word zeal means to have great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Now our objective and our cause is to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this objective is one that is worthy of having zeal in order to obtain it. Now to have zeal for anything, you must first believe that that which you are pursuing after is true and that it is obtainable. Amen. And you also must believe that it is worth the effort to strive to obtain it. Mm-hmm. Amen. So then you must be able to see the value of that thing for which you are striving. Those who are zealous for Christ have believed the message and have been given to see the treasures of the world to come and have seen that those things are only available in Christ Jesus. And this is why we are zealous to seek after Christ and to obtain the the treasures that are available in him. When you can properly see the rewards laid up for the faithful, then there is no effort that is too great. There's no price too high. And there's nothing of this world that's too dear to us that will not sacrifice it in in order to obtain the prize. Colossians 2, verse 3, speaks of how, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Those who can properly see this will strive to obtain this with, with zeal. When one member of the body is zealous in seeking Christ, it provokes the other members to be zealous also. This, this is so because zeal is an attribute of God. John, John chapter 2, verse 15, verses 15 through 17, Jesus is demonstrating what it is to, to be zealous for a cause. And this is when he had gone into the temple and saw men making merchandise of things in his father's temple. It said, and when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Amen. So we see here, Jesus is demonstrating what it is to have zeal. Jesus saw these men making merchandise of things in his father's temple, and And this was a place that was to be purely devoted to worshiping God. And Jesus, he saw this and he had to make it right. He had to cast out everything that was defiling because this was the place for his father to be worshiped. Zeal is provoking to the members of the body of Christ because it is an attribute of God. When we see our brethren portraying attributes of God, we want to be like God. And so we see our brethren displaying this for us, and it provokes us to want to be more like God as well and to, and to, to, uh, to respond in the same way. Amen. This is one of the ways in which the body edifies itself together. As we work together to to do this, we are helped by one another. 
And finally, zeal is a, ne is a necessity. This is not something that we can do without. Uh, today, it's often implied that zealousness is something reserved for the super Christian, someone who's really, really zealous, but the, the majority of the people are just average. But this is not the case at all. This is Amen. not how the body of Christ works and Amen. operates. Amen. We all are to be zealous. Uh -huh. We won't be able to obtain the prize if we're half-hearted or if we're reserved in this. And those who, who properly see what they're, what they're seeking to obtain, this is, not an, this is not a problem. Those who can see the value of it, they will respond with, with zealous uh, in a zealous nature. Hebrews 11.6 says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Yeah. So God doesn't even reward the half-hearted or the average yeah. with these treasures that we're seeking. These are, these are reserved for the zealous. And so we want to be zealous and be pleasing to God in this so that we can obtain this prize how would it benefit anyone to seek after something that in the end they're not even going to obtain it because they were they didn't seek hard enough or they didn't they weren't diligent enough so if we're going to expend any energy to obtain this we want to be sure that we obtain it in the end and not have wasted our energy Amen. so we know we know that god doesn't reward mediocrity and he's not called us to be average he expects excellence, and he, give a, he gives us the grace to be excellent in everything. So, brethren, I want to encourage you today to be, to be zealous and to uh, seek diligently to receive the things of God. And every opportunity that you have to look at the, other, at the brethren around you, whenever you see them displaying an attribute of God, to seek to, to be like God your brethren in that regard because this is how we edify one another so now brother jonathan will come and further expound the text in this verse we certainly learn the value that a good report has the benefit that it has on the body of christ the corinthian brethren they moved their fellow brothers and sisters to good works by what they did and through this we learn to do the same and not surprising at all these brethren are still provoking believers today. Yes. Now, how is that for a testimony? Amen. That's a testimony I want to have. That after I'm gone and my, like my generation's gone, people still are provoked by what I do. Amen. Now, as far as our main topic is, is concerned, this message is not for select members of the body. Yeah. There is such a thing as there's different functions. Certain parts of the body, they have different, they have different um, abilities, different gifts, but you know, they all work together. But each one kind of has a different job, so to speak, like my own body. Like my hands don't do what my feet do, but they work together. Well, this isn't one of those things. It isn't exclusive to certain members, but this is something that's common among every member of the body. Amen. And Sister Maddie is absolutely right. This isn't the kind of thing you want to look at as extraordinary. Zealous, a zealous believer, that's something rare, sparse, or like just beyond what the norm is. This is the norm. This is the standard. When we read of things like this, that's how you look at it. This is how everyone is, as opposed to this is just how the certain ones are. Every, each and every member can provoke other parts of the body to love and good works. I will also say that I do have the same mindset that Paul had when writing these things. Concerning the necessity of making these things known to you. Seeing that one of the brethren addressed this passage and did so very well. Brother Michael, he gave a good word on this very passage in his message. And so, with that in mind, I feel it is very, as Paul said, superfluous for me to say these things to you. Or as another version put it, it's unnecessary. Like, I don't need to bind these things on you like a law. I don't need to build an argument or a case as to why you need to do this. I don't. It's already being done. I see that people here already have a readiness of mind to enter in such a work. Yeah. you got to know your crowd. That is, you have an eager willingness to enter in such a work, to support your brother and help one another the way that the Corinthian brethren are helping their brethren in this passage. Now, the work that is in reference here is to support 
that the Corinthians sent or collected for poor saints in Jerusalem, doing so without being forced to do so, but giving out of love for their brethren. And the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And these brethren are like a display of what that is. Cheerful giver. Giving from the heart, not out of just mere obligation or command. The main thing here being shown is kindness and consideration for the saints of God, the household of faith. This is why Paul opens this chapter by mentioning you're ministering to the saints. By observing this work of the Corinthians, we see what the love of the brethren will cause believers to do. These brethren very well are an example of having the mind of Christ, looking on the interests of others rather than your own. These brethren sent support to poor saints, which in a sense required like a sacrifice on their part. Jesus himself in Scripture says he became poor in order for you to become rich. Yeah. Yeah. He became a man with his deity sheath and suffered humiliation, embarrassment, and death. But by doing so, he made us kings and priests and able to obtain heavenly treasures much more valuable than earthly ones. My point being that the brethren in our text are taking after the one that they follow. They sacrifice in order to better others. They follow Christ, and so they are doing what is necessary to be just like their master. If, in fact, a good report such as this can move other believers to good works for the Lord, then it is all the more important that we do not neglect to do this kind of thing ourselves. In our day, there is a great lack of good report, and this is due to a dead church, a church that's not functioning the way that it's supposed to, so there's really, it seems like there's not really many good things to say. But it's also good... To always, when you hear good things being done, things that will move, make these things known. Because this does have an effect on the body of Christ. And it's also good to live in such a way that fellow believers can boast of you to other believers as a means to provoke them to do good for themselves. Which brings us to this very important truth that must be seen. Anytime you do anything in the name of the Lord, you must understand that you're setting a standard for others to follow. When Jesus suffered in the earth, it said that he set an example for us to follow. Speaking of suffering for well-doing, it's in 1 Peter 2, 21. You want to know how to do this? Well, Jesus sets an example for you to follow, something you can look to. Paul told the Corinthians to be followers of me as I am a follower of Christ. Paul wrote to Timothy, let no man despise his youth. But then he added something that could easily be applied to all members of the body, which is be thou an example of the believers. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. That's something everyone can do. That's something everyone will do when living by faith. When considering things like this, the message is abundantly clear. Whenever we do anything for the Lord, we set an example for other believers. You want to be the kind of believer that can be an example of what a good and faithful servant is. Well, if you want to have an understanding of living by faith, you could say, well, I'm an example of that. This is the standard right here. When you read things, you know, you do display these things before others. What do they see? You want to be an example and live in a way that moves fellow brothers and sisters to live godly and do better in what they do. Paul even mentioned boasting of the Corinthian brethren to those at Macedonia. His mentioning of the Corinthian brethren would provoke the brethren in Macedonia to help the fellow saints also. You notice the wonderful part about this passage is that when one group of believers made a move, other ones joined right in and helped. That's an example of what was said to Titus concerning what kind of people Jesus died to redeem. Titus was told that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and purify him unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. It is written that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That was in Ephesians 2.10. With these things being the case, it only makes sense that the saints are <clears throat> attracted to good works and desirous to enter into them. When a saint sees something good being done, a good work in the sense of Scripture, something being done for the Lord, well, hey, I want to be part of that too. Let me, let, let me enter that. Let me help you out with that. That's the way the saints think. No true saint observes good works and thinks, do I have to? Do I really have to help you out? Don't they have enough help already? I mean, I hear people talking like this. This troubles me because this is just not the way the saints of God think. They work together. They want to enter in. 
They sacrifice. This is just this is their na- this is their nature. We live in a time where the church appears to be sleeping on the job in this area. When something good is being done for fellow saints, no one seems to be jumping in and being part of it. Could it be that the interest of the so-called modern church is not what it claims to be? My point is that people of faith love to do good works for the brethren. Like that's their interest. Love for the brethren is evidence that we're born of God and faith without works, faith isn't confirmed. So these people, they're displaying that also. They're confirming their faith. They're showing evidence of it by what they're doing. It should not even be a question for any believer to want to be part of something that would benefit fellow believers. This would be a good time for self-examination because the people of God, they are. They're described as zealous. That's a description. Not something they ought to be. It's what they are. That's what Jesus died to obtain. But let's not leave it at that. Many people are zealous. They're zealous of good works. That is, they're eager to obey the Lord and show subjection and gratitude in everything that they do. They do not do just these works out of mere obligation, but because they take delight in these works. This also does not just refer to doing work, but promoting good work also. It's a desire, it's zeal to do good work, and it's a desire, it's zeal to see good work done. That's what they're doing here. See, I always looked at that like zealous to do something, but zealous to encourage others to see it too, to see it done around you as well as in your own self. The works are done with great zeal, and I found this, oh, it's an older definition, but it's a good one, saying that zeal means passionate ardor in the pursuit of anything. In general, zeal is an eagerness of desire to accomplish or obtain some object, and it may be manifest either in favor of any person or thing or in opposition to it in a good or bad cause. So zeal has to do with passion, intensity, eagerness, enthusiasm, and fervor, things that are far from dull and lifeless. And it's like zeal is the opposite of that. The fact that the saints do good works, they really, they really, when they do good works, they really throw themselves into it, so to speak. It's not done half-heartedly. Now, I was glad that the example of Jesus came up because Jesus doesn't, I wouldn't say didn't, he doesn't do anything half-hearted. Jesus doesn't slack on the job. Everything he does, he does the best of his ability. And his people follow that same standard. You see, when things are done for the Lord, his people have this kind of spirit produced in them. Because God deserves the best you have. And he demands the best you have. In fact, he says, you're going to give me your best or I'm just not going to receive it. (laughs) That's the master that we serve. God will not settle for a fickle people that have no heart for when it comes to doing things for him. That's not what God wants. That's not what he's going to get either. You can tell where a person's heart is by what they apply themselves to. What do you throw yourself into? I mean, it's something I have to examine myself, but there are, people can easily like take, like, what do I give myself to? What do I throw my whole self into? And what are the things I just could care less about? Things I don't do with my whole heart. Something to think about. Now, why would these brethren be so willing to help their fellow brethren in Jerusalem? You are zealous for good works to the extent that you can see things spiritually. Spiritual insight will cause zeal. Now, just say a word about the saints here. The saints there said in Scripture be a holy people, a holy nation, a holy temple of the Lord, a holy priesthood, and a people who are chosen by God. Other things that are said is that the people of God are declared to be the ones that he has accepted and Jesus has received as his own sheep. God has given them the Holy Spirit. Their names are written in heaven. Jesus meets with them. They have access to God through faith. They are taught by the grace of God. They are forgiven and and the blood of Christ covers their sins. They have an eternal inheritance. They are people that God has prepared wondrous things for and they've been brought and redeemed and belong to God and they're the ones for whom Jesus will return. Now, if if you really see these things about the saints, wouldn't it make sense to help and do whatever it takes to benefit the brethren with great zeal, seeing that you see them for what they are, rather than just people on earth, your brother, your sister, your mother. You've got to get beyond that. See them the way God has described them. Do Do these things not move you to consider your brethren and look for ways to service them, as opposed to helping when someone asks? looking for an opportunity. 
When you see the people of God for who they are, you will be zealous to edify and assist and help those who are in Christ. So like when you read commands, read words like love the brethren, or you read something like consider one another, don't look at that like commands. Yeah. Like when you're saying like, Brother Dave, love Brother Tony. Or Brother Ricky, you need to be more considerate. See, this, <laughs> that's not how you look at this. But rather, look at those as exhortations to continue in those things, because this yeah. is the nature of those in Christ. Yeah. <laughs> They're not forced to do this. Like, we'll put it this way. Let brotherly love continue, continue not let it begin. Now, it's important to be zealous in the right areas because there is such a thing as zeal not according to knowledge. Paul persecuted the church with zeal, thinking that it was the Lord's work. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting that Paul in a state where he wasn't doing the right thing, he had more zeal than the churches of today because he saw it as God's work. Even he was wrong, but because the Lord's name was on, he threw himself into it. But that was another example of zeal not according to knowledge. He died, did it ignorantly and in unbelief. But he still had the zeal, though. Yes. Yeah. But just as zeal could be a great benefit, it could also be a great source of damage. If a person is passionate about the wrong things, it will cause much damage to the saints of God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sadly, many people today have zeal and passion for what they do, yet they don't do the right things. People who work with zeal and passion, these people like that, they're influential. It's good to point that out. People who throw themselves in what they do, they do what they do with excellence, and they do it with this intensity, this is like has an effect on those around them to do the same. But if something vain is being done, then others will be provoked to do things that are not profitable. Yeah. So move people to do the right thing. Amen. It's good to remember, as we come to close here, that what you do is observed and talked about. We are an assembly of believers, but we're not to be ignorant of what other brothers and sisters are doing around us. And nor should we be ignorant of the fact that other believers are very aware of what we are doing. Here's some scriptures that like speak these kind of facts. In Romans 1.8, Paul writes, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I'm telling people don't think like this today. Or later in the same book, in chapter 16, verse 19, it says, Your obedience has come abroad unto all men. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8, Paul writes, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. So we need not speak anything. And then this last text here, Ephesians 1, 15 and 16 says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord and your love unto all the saints, yeah. cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you always in my prayers. So, you see, Christ, he said we were the light of the world and that we were to let our light shine before all men. You think that's just talking about the ungodly? That includes the saints of God, too. <laughs> we let our light shine so that men may, well, as Jesus said, so men may see your good works and glorify God. See, that's what these passages are talking about. I saw this, I heard this, and so I gave God the glory. It moved me to do something also. And so, I mean, we have other brethren that we know of. I mean, just to name a, troop, name a few, we have like Love of the Truth Fellowship. We have Banner of Truth. We have our brethren in Delaware. We have ministries in India, Africa, and Pakistan. Like, well, how did we come in contact with these people? It's because someone heard something. And, you know, we're working together now, too. Yeah. Amen. They joined in the work. They saw zeal. They saw intensity and passion for the work of the Lord. And so this provoked them to kind of enter in and join in. And now the work's even more productive than it was before. So, I mean, we're seeing these things displayed. And it's good to, like, see, like, well, why, why, did, why have these things happened? This is, like, the scripture's, like, you know, giving an explanation as why things are the way that they are right now. And see, the saints here knew what was going on in the other churches. That's something to consider, too. Like, if something happened, they weren't like, oh, really? I didn't know that was going on in Jerusalem. We were, like, you know, busy doing this and that. They knew the state of the churches. They were not, li like, living on an island, living in their own little world. These saints at Corinth knew the state of the saints in Jerusalem. And what they were doing for those saints was reported to Macedonia, when these cities aren't, like, really close together. I mean, I'll leave it up to you to like figure like the exact mileage of differences, but these aren't like local neighbors. These are long distances, thousands of miles. 
miles away, but they knew what the other brother needed. Now this is being this this is being displayed in our sem- in, in our gatherings also, and the example I thought of was the epistle of encouragement. <laughs> They're very well aware of the needs of the saints, and so that awareness they gather together and they help that brother out, or brethren, you know, whoever is needing help at the time. But that's like an example of what this is. These saints in Jerusalem needed help, and so the Corinthian brethren they gathered together and they. They, they contributed something. So we're doing that and that. So I say that to encourage you to all the more throw yourself into that work that we have because it has a really grand effect on the saints. When good works are observed, others will be provoked to enter into those works themselves. Like the word provoke in our time is often used in a negative sense, mostly used in the sense to irritate, cause someone to become angry, and it's used that way in the Bible too. Like God says, you provoked me to wrath, but it's not just used that way. In this sense, the Corinthian brethren were like rousing, exciting, and impelling other churches around them to give to the poor saints in Jerusalem. It was not that the churches didn't want to help either, but that they needed someone to like kind of rise up and take the lead. That's what that people of Zealous will do. They'll, they jump right out in front, in the front line. If people, well, Here's the thing, see. If people take delight in righteousness, it's not going to be difficult to get them to join in the work. This wasn't like a challenge. Paul didn't have to rebuke these churches for not giving. Hey, why aren't you like those Corinthian brethren? They gave. Why aren't you giving? Selfish, stiff-necked people. Like, you didn't have to talk like you did to hard-hearted Israel. They saw it, and it wasn't even an issue. They, saw, they just saw it happen, and they did it. The churches were not complaining about having to give. That attitude was not present. Like, they don't need our help. Corinth sent them enough help. <laughs> they have enough. No. That the, the, the saints don't think this way. The fact that they did give confirms that the desire was there. The Corinthian brethren just helped them take action. So you can have this kind of effect on the saints as well. This is something I desire to be an expert in. I mean, grow in faith and you will become this kind of a person. Keep doing what you're doing and it will happen. See, I, I, like I said, I don't have to like talk to you like you're not doing this. I already know you're doing this. So my exhortation is not start, but continue. Keep doing it. So what do those who observe say? What is the report that we give to those around us? I believe this is something we can definitely do better in. Like I said, I'm not saying we're not doing well, but we can do better in it. And we will, by God's grace, if we continue in the faith grounded and settled. Just keep doing what you're doing. And we will do better. No need for harsh words here. Know what's going on around you and make reports when you hear good works being done. And also live in a way where you can provoke and move others to love and good works.